Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, so today we are um, running a webinar called Community Powered Conservation Case Studies. Um, so we've carefully curated this webinar um, so you can learn a little bit more about how to activate or get involved in a successful restoration or conservation program from the experts. Um, so today we're going to have the welcome address delivered by Justine, that's from the Habitat Foundation. So my name is Abza, I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, the first case study is um, on, on developing native tree nurseries with the Orang Asli Jahai in the Royal Balum um, State Park. So that's with Dr. Noor and Injit Shah Reza. So the second case study will be on hornbill conservation. That's with the Kampung Orang Asli Chui in Temenggur, also in Pera. That's from Yap Yapchin Ek, that's from MNS. And the third case study will be flying you over to Borneo. So we're going to be looking at the riverine uh, forest restoration in the Kinabatangan floodplain. And that's with the Orang Asli Sungai community, sorry, Orang Sungai community of Batu Pute. And that's with um, Martin Vogel from Coppel. So um, Justine, would you like to deliver the welcome? Okay, uh, good morning everybody. And it's really exciting to have you with us. I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar on community-based conservation case study. The Habitat Foundation is fully committed to the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, and we have been partnering the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, KETSA, in running a series of webinars on forest restoration. Uh, recently, we conducted a public poll on what people wanted to learn more about, and the highest ranked among these was how to strengthen the participation of local people interest. So we believe that these case studies are powerful. Communities are a tremendous resource, both in terms of energy and commitment, but also in terms of knowledge and insight, and with the capacity to adapt and innovate. And as we collectively head into an uncertain future, diversity gives us more options. Of course, there is a hard edge to this discussion. We are already experiencing the impacts of climate change. And in many cases, they are occurring more rapidly and more intensely than predicted. It is easy to feel overwhelmed by what is happening to our planet. We feel powerless, but there is no time for us to be spectators. We know that nature is part of the solution and safeguarding existing forest and helping to restore ecosystems helps us to tap into nature-based solutions. So the theme of World Environment Day this year is we are all part of the solution, which I take to mean in scientific terms that we need to throw everything that we have at this challenge. From the sharing of our panel today, our aim is to show that empowered and engaged communities are very much a part of our arsenal against climate change, working together. And most of all, openness was over 20 years. We learned that there is power in just making a start and being open to the lessons to be learned. Failure is that we have the opportunity to build relationships, team local people with conservation biologists and protected area managers with encouraging and lasting results. Our hope is that today we will awaken an interest among you. Perhaps you belong to a community or organization. Perhaps you have land that has the potential to be protected and reforested. Perhaps you have the potential to provide support in the form of funding or resources. So we sincerely believe that some of the models have the power to be expanded upon. If we can make a start, then we can really claim that we are being part of the solution. So with that, thank you for your presence here this morning. And we look forward to engaging with you in the chat discussion. With that, I hand over to Afsa. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Um, definitely agree with you that um, the beauty of ecosystem restoration is that it can happen at any scale and everyone has a role to play. Um, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Noor and Shah to share their screen and start their presentation. So Dr. Uh, Afsa, you want to introduce everybody first? Okay, all right. Yeah. So, Dr. Noor is a plant biologist and a consultant at TRCRC, and Shahreza is the director of the Perak State Parks Corporation. So he manages um, this protected areas in the state park, which includes the Royal Balloon State Park. So TRCRC, the Habitat Foundation, and Perak State Parks Corporation together are working with the Orang Asli Jahai, who work 
with, who live within the Royal Balloon Forest Complex and their wealth of ethnobotical knowledge and their familiar, familiarity with the phenology of the surrounding forests um, really provides a great contribution to conservation and restoration efforts. Um, yep, oh, sorry. So Afza, can I start my talk now? Do you see my slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, good morning and assalamualaikum to everyone. I hope you are all safe and healthy. Um, so I'll kickstart our session session today uh, uh, by explaining uh, some of the activities that we've taken in developing native tree nurseries with the Jahai Komitulum State Park. Um, from my side, I will talk more on the, the logistic and the technicality of running the nurseries. And then I invite uh, Tate Shah to talk about um, the community engagement and also participation in this project. And also the vision of the um, uh, Perak State Park Corporation um, um, for this project. So Afza mentioned briefly about the Jahai Nursery project in the webinar last week. So in case you need more, um, it's a nice continuation from the Greening Malaysia uh, webinar. Um, and our seeding project for the Jahai community is focused on three areas. So we focus on capacity building and then the seedling buyback and also eventually for forest restoration. So the, the capacity building introduced opportunity and also incentive for the Jahai community to involve actively in conservation. And also we provide the technical expertise for the Jahai participant to run mini nurseries in their settlement. So this is very important because running the nursery in their settlement means that they can stay at their kampong and at the same time pass, uh, actively involved in conservation. And we couple that with the seedling buyback program where we uh, provide the participant with income for uh, sustainable livelihood while they are able to give back to their communities. And uh, the, the seedlings and the seeds that we bought uh, will be used as a planting materials for the restor forest restoration, uh, particularly in the, uh, the forest landscape the, in, in Berak region. Uh, TRCRC have conducted uh, um, activities in seed collection, propagation, planting, and maintenance in Banon. We have the presence in the landscape. We have a tropical rainforest living collection um, that hosts about 30,000 seeds. And uh, we, uh, we, we are fortunate enough that uh, the, our presence is very uh, strategic in the sense that we're very close to the Royal Bloom State Park. Uh, where the uh, Jahai communities live in. And we also have experience before starting officially the project, we have uh, indirectly engaged with the local indigenous community in that area uh, during our seed collection expedition with MIM and WWF. So during the expedition, um, our team uh, interacted with the Orang Asli, with the Orang Jahai um, to know more about uh, where can we find the mother trees, what kind of trees are in fruiting, um, and that those information that were shared with us uh, are very important for uh, our seed collection activities. And we also had experience in running a similar seedling program with the Penan community in Sarawak, where we came uh, to the village of the Penan community, very deep in the forest, and we trained them on how to run a mini nursery and they use the uh, seedlings that they grow here uh, to sell uh, to the nearby villages for uh, restoration activities in the nearby village. Um, we also did a little bit of background work, stakeholder mapping of who's who in the landscape uh, to be, before we start the project. So we know that we want to work with the Jahai community given their presence and also their expertise of the landscape. And we, uh, we received full support and cooperation from the PSPC, uh, who, uh, who is in charge of the uh, Royal Bloom State Park. And we received funding from the Habitat Foundation. Um, and at the same time, we also looked at potential funders uh, to top up or to expand the project. Um, before we targeted uh, a specific village, village we did uh, some um, um, scoping exercise where we engaged with the local leaders 
in four different settlements to uh, get a sense of um, how to get a sense whether the kampung, the village is suitable for the nursery project and to see if the community is interested. Um, one thing that I would like to highlight is the uh, buy-in, the um, engagement from the community is key to making this uh, project successful. We can only go as far as the community um, um, are, are interested in. Um, so uh, from these uh, um, surveys, we identify Kampung Klewang as uh, the, the village, uh, as the community that we, we would like to work with. Um, so this is the overall program BC before COVID. So you can see here, we were planning to finish the whole program for about one year, um, but then um, um, there are some delays. So the project has been running for two years for now. And all the activities that we uh, conducted are centered on capacity building, ceiling buyback, and also forest restoration. So for the rest of my talk today, I'll go uh, one by one on the activities that we do to give you some ideas uh, of what kind of activities that you can do in your own community in case you want to start something similar to what we do in uh, the Royal Belong State Park. So we first launched the program in, uh, during the Global Tiger Day event in Greek. So we had Raja Pemai Suri Perak Tunku Zara officiating our uh, program. And then we, our team visited Kampung Klewang. So you can see here, we, uh, we pay respect, we talk to the, uh, to the Ketu Kampung, to the Tok Batin, to express our interest, to explain about the project, what we hope to achieve uh, with, the, uh, with the Tok Batin. So once we get um, a, a green light from the Tok Batin, then we identify the participants. Uh, we identify who might be interested um, in joining our seed training activities. And then we proceed with seed collection training. So you can see here, our team um, uh, go into the forest at their backyard, at Kampung Klewang and uh, surrounding areas. And from these activities, our team figured that um, the Orang Kampung, the Orang, As the Orang Jahai already know a lot about the plants, about the trees um, in their backyard. They, um, they share the, the use or the utility of different parts of the plants with our team. And from then, uh, our team focused the training on, um, on identifying the mother tree, uh, making sure that the seeds that are collected are not uh, mixed up among the mother tree. Um, so our team also trained them on how to tag the trees and also how to process the seeds so that um, you get good quality seedlings when us good quality seeds when you sell them to uh, interested buyers. And then we also combine the seed training, uh, seed, uh, uh, training with uh, seed purchase. So, so here we can see uh, that uh, we, uh, after we train, the, the Chahai people managed to collect quite a lot of seeds. And this happened towards the end of the year where the fruiting and the uh, musting season was. Um, and we were very lucky that we managed to collect quite a lot of deep throw cup species um, from this uh, expedition. And then uh, we uh, bring, we brought uh, the Jahai participant to our nursery in Banon. So this uh, exercise is very important because the, uh, as you know, that the, the Orang Jahai, they are very uh, expert in building their own uh, house, for example. So we just have to bring them, show them around the nursery, and then they instantly know what to do. So they just see with their eyes and or they already know how uh, a, a nice, a successful nursery look like. So this trip was important just to give exposure to them. And then uh, we, our team uh, visit them in their kampong, in the kampong Klewang. So we help them uh, identify a suitable location to build uh, the nursery. And then this is how the nursery look like. Uh, starting from this year, you can see at the beginning, there are uh, um, mostly seed plots where you get a lot of the uh, different seeds uh, germinated in the seed plot. 
And then more recently, you can see we have quite a lot of species, uh, quite of like seedlings already ready in polybag. So in this polybag, then these seeds will be ready uh, to be planted in uh, our targeted planting site. So at the moment, uh, they have about 1,500 uh, seedlings um, growing healthy in their nursery. We've done uh, so far two uh, seedling purchase in March and May. Um, and here, um, Encik Shah passed uh, the money to the participant uh, of the, the nursery project. And it, it's a small token, but uh, we hope that uh, it's uh, one of the way that we can provide incentive to get the project running and to get the uh, Jahai people interested in, in uh, uh, continuing the project. Um, so that's from me. So I uh, can see we focus on capacity building and then the seeding buyback for forest restoration. So for, for next plan, we want to identify the areas. Uh, we already identified areas in the Royal Bellum State Park uh, to do um, to kickstart our planting using the seedlings that are being grown in the nursery. Um, and we welcome any partnership or any contribution from people so that we can further expand the capacity building and also we can buy more seeds uh, and seedlings from the community to provide them more um, stable income. So I can uh, invite Encik Shah to further um, elaborate on the project. Okay, hi. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. No. First of all, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Charedza. I am the director of the Perak State Park Corporation. So within the, the Royal Bloom State Park, we have the Jahai community. The Jahai community is one of the few indigenous community that actually lives inside a protected area. Uh, many other communities live at the fringes and outside of protected areas. They do go into protected areas for, for uh, forest resource, but uh, unlike the Jahai, they live outside. So basically, we have several projects inside uh, Royal Bloom State Park. And uh, this uh, seedling nursery project is one of the most uh, important uh, pilot projects that we undertake. Whenever we do a project for the Orang Asli in uh, Royal Bloom, uh, first and foremost, we conform to uh, the FPIC protocol, which is free prior and info, uh, free prior informed consent, meaning we have to go and tell the Orang Asli what we intend to do, share, share our program, get their feedback and, and also get their buy-in and consent before we start anything. This is critical to work with the indigenous people. So the FPIC protocol is something the state park observed in all our projects and all our programs within the state park. Secondly, as we uh, design programs for the Orang Asli, we have four uh, important criteria that we uh, look to. Number one is the program or the projects must be within the, the landscape where the Orang Asli live. Uh, we try and uh, we make it, make it an objective that the projects are within where their kampung is, where they are familiar, uh, where, and, uh, where and what they are familiar with. We do not try to undertake projects where that they will have to leave their kampong and go out and do programs outside their villages. So uh, programs have to be within the locality uh, with subject matter that they are familiar with and they're easy and for them to easy to learn. And they have also local knowledge and local skills to contribute uh, to the project. That's number one. Number two is uh, there must be knowledge sharing. Uh, the orang asli must benefit from learning. They must acquire new knowledge, new skills. And the best ways of, of um, upskilling the orang asli is through experiential. There's no such thing as giving them books or PowerPoints and teaching them via uh, those non-traditional ways. They are experiential, they are quick to learn. But how we teach them is also equally important. 
So it is, um, it must be in a communication form that they understand. Uh, to this respect, we have a, a big number of orang asli working within the state parks. We have rangers, we have staff, we have general workers uh, working for the state park. And these state park staff are the uh, bridge between uh, us and the orang asli so that the communication is much better. Okay, so that's number two. There must be learning, there must be knowledge sharing, there must be a uh, skill given to the orang asli. Number three is that they must benefit financially. There must be an income stream to them while they do, do, while they do the project because um, you know, uh, if, if you take them away from their daily lives, which is uh, looking for a sustainable uh, livelihood uh, and ask them to go for training, ask them to do nurseries, they must be compensated with something for their time and their effort. And we want the project to be a project that is sustainable long-term for them as a source of revenue. So that's number three. Number four is the project must have conservation value. It cannot just be a project that has no conservation value. Uh, the Perak State Park uh, uh, is responsible for, uh, for protecting and conserving protected areas such, such as the Royal Bloom State Park. Therefore, any projects we undertake must have conservation value. When we first discussed this project with the RCRC, uh, we were looking at the reforestation or restoration of degraded areas within CFS PL2, which is the Central Forest Pine, uh, uh, on the on the uh, north and south of uh, of uh, Hutan Simpan Amanjaya, which is on the East West Highway. So uh, the state park takes a stand that any restoration is best uh, by using local indigenous species, meaning we don't want imported trees to be brought into the landscape. We want local species to be used for restoration. And uh, of course, there is a shortage of seedlings in terms of uh, local uh, species to be, to be replanted. When we discussed with uh, TRCRC, we saw this op opening that uh, if the orang asli can be upskilled, can be, can be uh, given the technical knowledge of building nurseries, they can provide the seedlings uh, for restoration and uh, they can make some income out of it. So that was the basis of how we started with the RCRC, whereby they were given areas within the East West Highway PL2 uh, to be restored. So I'm, I'm happy to, to note that the Orang Asli, as uh, Dr. Noor has mentioned, were very quick in terms of learning. So all this notion of the Orang Asli can't be reskilled, uh, cannot, uh, cannot learn, it's all out of the window. You know, Not only this project, but in every other project that we have done with the Orang Asli, they have shown that they can learn and they, are, can, they can be very good and very committed. So uh, the result is there for us to see. Yeah, One and a half years, and they have committed themselves fully to the project, and the project has given them revenue in terms from seed collections uh, to uh, building nurseries and then uh, supplying seedlings. So overall, I would just like to say that uh, it is a good opportunity for us to look to other areas and take some learning from this pilot project as per our studies and uh, use this as a template to other places, okay? Um, I, I will leave it at that for the time being and we'll be open to some questions and answers later on. But uh, this has been a win-win uh, win -win, uh, program, uh, not only for conservation, but also for the Orang Asli. Lastly, a strong collaboration. Uh, no one 
uh, organization, agency or party can do this job alone. So for the Perak State Park Corporation, our partners has been TRCRC as our technical partners. Our collaborative partners has been the Habitat Foundation that has given the initial funding for the purchase of seedlings, trainings, and also uh, for seed collection. Uh, and uh, our key partner moving forward is the Forestry Department. I've spoken to the Perak Forestry Department. Uh, the Forestry Department, as you know, has a big program in terms of uh, restoration and rehabilitation. And we would like to see that this program be part, at least in Perak, uh, for the Orang Asli to be able to supply seedlings uh, to success successfully do restoration in Perak. So with that, I thank you all. Back to you, Abza. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Shah, for that um, very insightful knowledge in terms of best practices for community engagement. Um, it's definitely important that the conservation value of the project also involves the knowledge transfer and upskilling of the indigenous communities as well. And um, as the saying goes, a slow start is a good start. Um, so we have a couple of questions um, that we can take now in the crowd um, that's directed to um, Dr. Noor. Uh, so question to Dr. Noor, where are the replanting sites of BNC? Is it in Amanjaya or in the Royal Balloon State Park? Um, so to answer that question, it really depends on the logistic. So originally, we were planning to uh, kickstart the planting in our site, the in TRLC Banon. But because of the MCO restriction and then the logistic of getting in and out the, of the Kampong Klewang, because to get into the Kampong, you have to take a boat, like boat ride for about 45 minutes. So then you have to factor in the time and the fuel cost. So for now, we would uh, we will begin the planting within the Royal Balloon itself because there are some areas that we identify as uh, slightly degraded. So what happened is we will get some of the um, seedlings that are already grown in the nursery and we'll plant them in those uh, degraded areas that we identified in Royal Balloon for now. Um, of course, there's more opportunity for us to plant within the, uh, within the bigger complex of Amanjaya Forest Reserve. But for now, Royal Balloon State Park. Thanks, Dr. Noor, for the answer. I hope that answers your question. Uh, question to Inchit Shah. Uh, you mentioned a lack of seedlings, but in the seminar of Greening Malaysia, the, Par the Parrot Forestry Department claims that they have over 1,000 trees. It's 1KK, so I don't know 1KK is what, but maybe 10K, if you mean, trees in their nurseries for replanting. How does the state coordinate with the Federal Forestry Department? Okay, thank you. I, I saw that question from Taj, okay? Uh, first of all, the target for the forestry department is 100 million trees. Uh, uh, for Para alone, I think our target is uh, 10 million trees. You know, uh, there is uh, there are a lot of uh, forestry nurseries, but uh, even if you if you go at full capacity, uh, forestry has a lot of of seedlings, but even if they go at full capacity. Uh, there will not be enough to meet the 100 million target uh, over the many years that the program runs. Uh, any assistance uh, from uh, any other party, including us, uh, would, help to, uh, would help the forestry to, to, to be able to get the seedlings for replanting. Um, but for uh, Para State Parks, uh, what is critical is that we, we and TRCRC are looking at forest species and forest species are, are not only uh, important for us to be able to, uh, to get endangered and also uh, indigenous species, uh, but uh, our aim is actually to reintroduce indigenous species at local, local sites, meaning Amanjaya and inside Royal Bloom. Uh, we have a very strict uh, policy of not introducing any species into Royal Bloom. Okay, so uh, in, in, that, in, in, in that sense, 
we have no choice but to build our own seedlings so that we can replant. We do not want to bring, even though of the same species, if as much as possible, we do not want to bring species from other states and other areas into Royal Bloom. We want to keep Royal Bloom pristine for many reasons, including research and long-term viability of uh, endangered forest species. So we are in the unique position of having one of the most pristine and, and strong gene pool in terms of uh, forest species. And this is what we intend to focus on. Uh, as I mentioned just now, uh, the current, the, the current uh, nurseries that we run are just pilot projects and small scales. But we understand now the methodology of how to train the Oranasli and what is their capacity. So the next phase, uh, together with TRCRC, is to actually upscale from one kampung, which is Kampung Klewang, into the other kampungs. We have uh, at least five other kampungs that are willing to take up. See, once they see that uh, this one kampung pilot project has proven to be successful, not only in terms of getting knowledge, but also in terms of revenue, now the rest of the kampung are, are, are willing participants. Unfortunately, the training program that we have planned uh, has been stopped due to COVID. Uh, especially now, uh, we are actually planning to go uh, in, in August to do more capacity building for the Orang Asli, but uh, Perak cases have, has increased. Orang Asli villages around the country, including in Perak, has been affected by COVID. The high rise of COVID uh, cases in Orang Asli villages, including death, so the Orang Asli two days ago came to me and asked me to stop every uh, outsiders going in. And I have to respect that. And I agree with them uh, because uh, the villages are so close and they interact in a, in a different level that any one person bringing the pandemic in will devastate the whole village. So we have to put things on hold. But the point is moving forward, that's why I've mentioned we are working with the, the Perak Forestry. This project will be part of Perak Forestry's nursery program to, uh, to be able to get forest species uh, to be replanted in a critical conservation area. High value conservation areas requires uh, a strong uh, local species. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Taj. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nolo, do you say something? Um, That's perfect, Tushana. Great. Right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Noor and Shah for your session. Um, so before we start on case two, um, just wanted to tell you guys there's a little technical error on the Facebook live streaming. So this video will be made available on YouTube um, right after um, this session. And if you have anyone who is urgently wanting to join right now, then I've shared the Zoom link um, to register to get the link for this web webinar. Okay, so um, with that, um, I'd like to introduce the second speaker, Yapchin Aik. Um, so he's a project manager for a long-standing project, which is the Hornbill Conservation Project with MNS. Um, and um, the, this year, the Habitat Foundation has provided a grant to the MNS um, to, towards implementing a pilot initiative under this long-standing hornbill project um, to develop a community nursery that stocks hornbill and other wildlife resource plants and trees. Um, so this nurseries will be developed with the Orang Asli from Kampung Chue, which is also within the Belum Tumungo forest complex. Take it away, yep. Yep, your mic, you're muted. Um, yep, start again. <laughs> Cute. This is this is something that we now have to always remember online. Unmute. Thank you, Avza, for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this Friday morning. I'm Yap, and I work for Malaysian Nature Society. Now, just in case if you wondered that you. Uh, entered into a wrong presentation, let me uh, put you at ease. We will still be talking about uh, hornbills, okay? 
but seeds are very much related to to hornbills and if you if you look at them in the wild you cannot help uh, but wonder about seeds also as well now in every forest restoration if you strip it down to the most basic denomination it will still come down to seeds so seeds are essentially the cradle of life It's not moving. Oops. Let me stop and share again. Uh, share. Right. Okay. So just a very quick uh, overview on where we work. We work in this uh, wonderful place called uh, Belom uh, Temenggo Forest Complex. Um, and uh, it consists of several uh, forest blocks. You know, we have Royal Belom, which uh, NJ Shah is responsible for, Fiat uh, Parrot State Parks Corporation, and the rest are forest reserves. So this area is an important uh, bird and biodiversity area. It's huge, 350,000 plus uh, hectares. And it is also contiguous with protected areas in, in South uh, Thailand as well. So this area has been identified as one of the key uh, ecological linkages under the central forest pine. And for MNS, we have a long-standing history in this area, uh, starting going way back in the 1990s with the expedition that MNS started in 1992 and 1997, if I'm not mistaken. So our story today begins with uh, horn, with a hornbill. And uh, this is this is a recording that's made by our hornbill guardians. And what it shows is a pair of nesting great hornbills. And Papa Bird has returned and starts to feed mom and possibly chick inside uh, the nest with uh, fruits. It can be many, many different kinds of fruits, and sometimes it can only be figs. And, it, and to do that, it has to regurgitate. So it keeps its fruit in a gula pouch, and it sort of regurgitates it out, holds it gingerly at its beak to pass it on to mom. So that itself is actually a skill. So I, I dare anyone to mimic that using chopsticks and try to pick up something round to see whether you can have the dexterity. So throughout a breeding period, uh, the male hornbill will bring a variety of fruits uh, to feed the female and the, and the chick. And once they've eaten, and they, the female and the chick will defecate or, or, or uh, uh, expel the seed, outside of the nest tree. So this, this clip is, is about a minute long. It shows one feeding bout uh, throughout uh, the day, and there will be several of these throughout the day. Yeah. But during the feeding session, uh, you can see that the male bird is very cautious. It's very alert. And the slightest feeling of uneasiness, they will uh, move on. And there it goes. Yeah. So hornbills are known as uh, seed dispersers. So in, in a way, they are uh, helping uh, forests to regenerate. And you know, it's no surprise that they are called farmers of the forest as well. And uh, in, in the back of an envelope calculation, not by me, uh, by the Thailand Hornbill Project, an adult, uh, and a hornbill, from the point of being a chick until to adult, you know, uh, its entire lifetime, they can possibly plant perhaps 14,600 trees in its lifetime. So this is a free service that's rendered uh, uh, by hornbills uh, in the ecosystem that it lives. So it is no surprise that, you know, uh, fruits that is defecated by hornbills you know, sometimes uh, considered as you know, uh, liquid gold, you know, as the cartoon showed on the side. 
Now for hornbills, there are different types of seeds that they, the fruit, fruit that they consume. Now in, uh, for wildlife in Malaysia, a preliminary search uh, on the published information, uh, wildlife are known to consume up to over 1,000 plus species of fruits in Malaysian rainforest. So we are not, spot, we are not lacking of choice in deciding what uh, can be planted or should be planted. But to a hornbill specifically, they look at two things. They look at seeds that can open when it ripes, ripens or seeds that uh, doesn't open, but it remains as a, a fruit itself you know, when, it, when it ripens. So scientifically, you know, the proper term, they call it uh, dehiscent, which opens, and indehiscent, which uh, doesn't. So one of the amazing fruits that you, you can see here in this, in this collage is you know, the fruit on the top uh, right, uh, which is a, a nutmeg. So the nutmeg, when it ripens, it will open. So the hornbill can use its beak to pluck the fruit out from the fruit itself. So there are also other, other fruits here you can see, uh, figs, uh, which is also important in their diet. So in a rainforest uh, in Malaysia, there's great diversity of figs that we can find. I think uh, figs under the family called Morasse is probably one of the largest group of uh, plant uh, families with many, many different uh, species. And what is shown here is just one single tree, but on that tree, one, the fruit, once the fruit ripens, it is supporting so many different kinds of uh, wildlife, including hornbills. We had great hornbills. We had, uh, sorry, we had rhinoceros hornbills. We had helmeted hornbills. We had uh, oriental pine, bushy crested. But at the same time, you know, it also attract mammals as well. We have primates, and uh, there are others like uh, giant squirrels. And at the bottom, I'm quite sure that uh, wild pigs will probably pick up uh, what has fallen down to the ground. So in Belum Tamango, uh, at the moment, we are able to at least identify some of the uh, figs that is of value and that's being fed on, uh, fed on by uh, hornbills. But there are definitely more uh, species to, to be discovered. Another group of plants which is probably under, under appreciated and undervalued and perhaps in restoration work are palms. And these are native palms, not exotic or introduced palms. So there are two kinds of palms that are found in Belum Tumbongo, which we have found to have uh, uh, value to hornbills because they do eat them uh, during the, the breeding season. So you can see on the top left, you know, a, a group of uh, bushy crested hornbills congregating on the, on the fruit bunch and picking up the, the the ripe ones. Whereas on the bottom, you can see a great hornbill also uh, uh, taking advantage of a, a fruiting palm. Now, what is the nutritional value of such uh, of palm fruits? At this point in time, we, we don't know. But you can see that uh, in terms of forest restoration, one can also possibly include uh, palms if that's suitable. So, in Malaysia, there are not many studies that uh, or documentation of hornbills uh, eating plants, but those that we, we, we can track are only maybe about 16. And what we have found out, you know, cumulatively, you know, we have six uh, different plant, plant families that is of value to uh, hornbills. And these are Example, as I said earlier, you know, uh, Morase, very diverse family. You have Meristicase, basically nutmegs, Malayase, and uh, so forth. So, to us, in terms of before we even move to forest restoration or rehabilitation or even uh, starting a nursery, understanding the forest is very important. And we look at it from the, from the perspective of uh, hornbills. So, only of late, uh, beginning in 2018, we started to also include monitoring phenology, which is the flowering and fruiting patterns uh, in Belum Temenggo to better understand what is the peak season of, uh, of the fruiting uh, of fruits in, in the landscape. You know, when does it flower? When does it end? 
now what is actually the pattern from year to year. So as part of our work, we established uh, uh, 48 circular plots, about 30 uh, meter in diameter. And each of them, uh, cumulatively, with GPS tagged about 1,300 trees, uh, that is 40 centimeters and, and above. And we monitor them every single uh, month. So what you see below is the pattern that we have uh, been able to generate uh, to date for about three years, except for COVID. Uh, that was last year, where for the first three months, we couldn't do absolutely anything. Uh, due to restrictions. So for belong to Mongo, we now have a better understanding in which fruiting period uh, for this landscape probably occurs from or, or starts to peak from May until uh, June or uh, sorry July, August before it starts going down. But for 2021, you can see the, the, the fruiting peak is going higher and higher. So that may be corresponding with uh, what many say could be masting year for uh, uh to Mongo this year. So this work is carried out by our hornbill guardian. So they do not only monitor hornbills, but as I shared earlier, they also monitor trees. And they are skilled, they are trained, they are skilled to, to take down uh, important parameters when uh, doing phenological work, as uh, I showed some examples below. Now, for within the plots, it's also not enough. Uh, as I mentioned, fix are also important. So we also monitor fix as well. This is just an example of one uh, area that we monitor, uh, one forest valley that we monitor. Uh, and that shows that almost every single month, there will be some fixed fruiting, uh, except for very, very few uh, occasions where there's uh, none. So these, these uh, numbers, you know, the fig ID number, these are those that has been uh, confirmed uh, feeding on uh, uh, the fix itself. And as Hornbill Guardians monitor trees, uh, uh, nesting trees of Hornbills, they also, we also document uh, what kind of trees that they use. And for Balum to Mongo, uh, we've, we've sort of been able to identify 14 species uh, belonging to, to eight families. So the minimum size that the tree, uh, that the Hornbills need uh, for a nesting tree is about 227 uh, girths. Girth, not diameter at breast height, but girth at uh, breast height, at breast height, uh, ukulele. But for Malaysia and Thailand, uh, based on literature, uh, you have can have up to 34 species of trees, uh, forest trees that's being used by hornbills. So with this knowledge comes the question, when or where do we collect the seeds? And um, the masting seems to be a hot topic now. So masting years, but uh, is one that you can also uh, focus on. But masting years, as far as we can see, are mostly diptero cups. So if you want to collect, uh, uh, want to plant nest trees, then diptero cups are one way to go. But other opportunity will be looking at hornbill middens. Midden is just a fancy word for hornbill toilet. Okay? So whatever the, the, the hornbills defecate uh, out of the out of the nest will probably end up at the bottom of its tree. So how it looks like, sometimes it looks uh, very dirty, as you can see on the bottom left. So you can see a lot of seeds protruding. So these are possibly some of the sources that you can also collect. And I think uh, some research has shown that you know, if some of the seeds that have gone through the gut of the hornbill might germinate even better. So the information also that we have gathered to, uh, to date the phenological information is also put to best use as now we know when is the fruiting climax. So you can prepare towards uh, those months to optimize your efforts in the field. So the idea to start a nursery is actually gained from an inspiration from my colleagues in India who works for the Nature Conservation Foundation. They have projects in the Eastern Himalayas and Western Ghats, uh, both biodiverse uh, sites uh, in, in the world. And they have also started uh, community projects to reforest uh, degraded forests uh, and also to plan for forest connectivity. So these are also powered by their local communities, which some of them are also humble guardians also. 
So these are some of the pictures to show that the, the work that they've been involved in. So forest restoration to us is a very long-term journey. It's, uh, but since this is the decade of uh, UN decade of ecosystem restoration, I think this is a very, very good, we have very, very good 10 years to make our efforts count. But at the same time, uh, while we're doing this, we are also uh, uh, helping to achieve our sustainable development goal aspirations. You know, there are three targets that, uh, three areas that we can uh, hit, hit on. And MNX has been very fortunate that we have very supportive uh, partners. We have the forestry department, Para Forestry, and also the federal forestry departments. We have uh, Perheletan, and also we have uh, Inche Shah, you know, Para State Park Corporation. So these are essential partners that we work with uh, in Belong to Mongo. So with the generous grant from uh, the Habitat Foundation, thank you so much for believing in us. We have started to pilot a small scale uh, community nursery. So we're experimenting with uh, home built food plants. So this is also hopefully to, to, to provide um, uh, interest, to generate interest with the local community that there's a different uh, conservation work that we can be in, involved in and not just home bills. Our working model is kind of simple. Uh, we have hornbill guardians whose primary responsibility is to understand hornbills, forest, uh, hornbills and forest in interactions. Of course, they monitor hornbill resource use, uh, feeding, nesting, and also phenology. So that, that body of work generates knowledge, and that knowledge is, is uh, uh, used uh, to power the nurseries that uh, we hope to small scale nurseries that we hope to 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 establish. So the home guardians also help to collect seeds, and they will pass it on to the next uh, set of team. Uh, you can call it seed guardians. So the the people here will be uh, uh, responsible to to care for the plants, to experiment and maybe fail, and also to document. And this combination of hornbills and plants is where we hope uh, leads to activities uh, in forest restoration, either within the site of Belong to Mongo, or it could be also outside, depending on uh, what is the purpose. So this will not be possible without partnerships with the government agencies and also uh, donors. Restoration can be done at a different scale. It, it need not be large scale. Sometimes it can also be very small, but it is also important to, to innovate to do pilots so we can learn uh, and see what works best. And this is also important uh, because whatever we do here links back to national work programs such as the Central uh, Forest Pine. This is a picture uh, to show you that uh, we've made some progress before COVID shut down everything, uh, but it's still progressing. Uh, we have a small team, so we aim to uh, experiment up to about a thousand plants. Hopefully we can do a bit more than what we target. And uh, we'll we're basically still work in progress. So in this slide, uh, it says lesson learned, but in reality, we are still learning. And I think we will be continue to, to be learning. The lesson is that it is always really never easy, uh, going to be easy in the field. There are many challenges, uh, location, access, and working with uh, orang asli, you know, different kampongs within the same landscape can have different interpretation, different acceptance towards any project. So we have to respect, we need to respect that. And we need to, to see how to work best. Progress is slow, you know, it takes time. Uh, we make mistakes, but failure is not a bad thing because we can learn for it, from it. And not to forget that we are dealing with people here. So people have different levels of you know, uh, learning capabilities. What is a strong point here is also that we want we amalgamate, you know, we combine scientific knowledge, uh, modern conservation scientific knowledge, together with traditional ecological knowledge. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, two so, minutes. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we need to learn to listen, to share back the results with them, you know, and uh, to create learning opportunities exposure. Document your forest ladder. You know, our forest is rich. It's not just about dipterocarps, but it's also beyond dipterocarps. So with 
with the kind of uh, documentation we have, you know, maybe we can think of different possibilities. Is there opportunities beyond restoration? What about food security? You know? um, involving as many people, uh, uh, interested people, and also women as, uh, as best as possible. And, in, and for me, as a man working in honestly, to involve women is very difficult because they were very, very shy talking to me. So I have to find a different way to engage uh, women if we don't have uh, female staff. So both genders need to have opportunity. When we work in a landscape in, uh, in doing forest restoration, uh, doing nurseries, I think it is also good to put in our mind uh, how to build an ecosystem that provides green jobs. You know, uh, how, to, how to look at new ways of earning money for Orang Asli because forest resources is possibly diminishing, although it's very hard to, to quantify. This is based on perhaps my, my uh, our observation. Uh, you know, they harvesting the tan, harvesting fish. There's also no, there's also a limit that you know how much the orang asli can earn, and not to mention that populations of orang asli within the landscape will continue to grow through birth. So with an ecosystem like this, then perhaps we can link to health, education, food security, and so forth. And last but not least, this is a very very long term project. When I say long, I think it goes beyond more than three years, more than that. And I think you will hear from uh, my colleagues at Coppel how long it can be. But even for the Hombi project, it is already more than 10 years. So um, just to show that you know, our, our work here is not in uh, isolation, uh, our vision for Blum Temango uh, is such. Um, but it basically talks about involving more of Orang Asli, create, creating safe havens, that means protecting forests, but also uh, rehabilitation and restoration. This is also in line with more or less the golden, 10 golden rules of large-scale forest restoration. Uh, I think that has been shared around uh, uh, recently. So last, the seeds are life. You know, hornbills depend on them, so do humans. And humble seeds do grow into forests if we nurture them. So treat our forests right, and the forest will treat us right in return. Okay. So thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for all the donors, to all the donors and supporters that have uh, believed in MNS uh, and its work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yap. Yeah, that was really insightful that you highlighted the symbiotic relationship between flora and fauna, in particular the hornbills. Um, yeah, so it's, I hope that inspires the listeners today to understand the different ecological function of trees um, and not just look at the tree as just a tree. Um, so next up, we have um, Martin Vogel from Coppel. Um, Martin, inviting you to share your screen. Um, so Martin currently is working in the Lower Kinabatangan area in uh, Sabah, Borneo. Um, and what Kopel is, it's a community ecotourism cooperative um, of the Batu Pute community. Um, and it was set up to reverse the losses and also utilize on ancient indigenous traditional knowledge um, and also creating some economic value for them um, to you know, have a higher appreciation of the mega diverse rainforests um, in the area. So you'll hear a little bit more from Martin about his project. Afsa, is that, am I on? Yeah, you're on. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for everyone for joining today. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for Justin, Afsa, uh, inviting us to share, uh, get us out of our tempurung down here in Kinabatangan, uh, meet the outside world since COVID. Uh, we have had very few people visit us. Yeah, so this, uh, it's nice to be with you here today. Um, yeah, so thanks for organizing this. Okay, so today I'm gonna just go through very quickly. Uh, we've been doing this since, uh, in terms of forest restoration since 1999. So how, how to uh, squeeze 20 years into 15 minutes is pretty hard. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about our cooperative uh, up front, just to talk about how our community is involved in this. And then I'm going to, uh, share a little bit about the area and why we're actually doing forest restoration in this area. Yeah, and then I'll sort of start talking about the actual process uh, of restoration. So I'll tell you a little bit about our restoration story. Um, 
and show you some of the results today. Yeah, and then I'll sort of wrap things up with talking about uh, well, where we are now uh, in a COVID world and where we are moving forward. Yeah. Okay, so I'll kick start today by just uh, sharing some pictures of our team. Yeah, so these, these are the heroes that do all the hard work. This team, this one is Mimi's team. So you see uh, this family groups, uh, families and friends, they group together into teams. Uh, this is Mimi's team. He's been working with us for probably about eight or 10 years. And this is, uh, these guys are amazing. They do, they just do totally amazing work. Uh, here's another team, uh, just to share, meet some faces today. Say hello to these guys. Uh, this is Shanti's team. Uh, down here, you see uh, Jai. So he's our conservation manager. Uh, he looks after all of the conservation program, which is uh, bigger than just the restoration, forest restoration work. We do some lake restoration work, cave restoration, a lot of monitoring work, which I'll talk to a bit later on. Okay, who else is involved? Well, he's a superstar to us. So this is Norsali. He He's actually the head of the restoration work itself. Um, he's the leader. Uh, he's a guide. He's a star of our program when we have visitors. Uh, he's totally amazing. And the work, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about the work they do later on. Okay. Uh, here's some more people that's involved. So we have uh, most of the nature guides because our program is a, is a tourism program. We have uh, volunteers and, and students coming to our program. So all these guys over here are uh, the guys that, you know, for the last 10, 15 years have been working with visitors to take them out to do restoration. I mean, helping our restoration program. And down here, you've got some uh, guys that have been working uh, recently over the last uh, six months uh, on our carbon plots. So basically, we're mapping out some of the areas that we're restoring and so on. So it's really hard for me to show you all of the, the people that's been involved over the last 15 or 20 years from the community. But just to give you a bit of an idea, um, these are the, some of the people that's involved at the moment. Uh, here's some of our uh, office admin procurement, uh, the people that pay, pay the gaji. Uh, they also get involved either tagging on our tree planting days. And of course, uh, over here, we have pretty much an annual program of working with local schools. Uh, we even get the local school students involved. So this is our team that, that uh, work really well with our environmental education program and so on. So I think um, moving into talking about our cooperative and so on, I think needless to say, we are a community-based tourism business, right? Uh, and over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, we've had literally uh, thousands of people come through our program, uh, either uh, Malaysian, uh, international visitors. Uh, every year we have about 2000 people come through our program uh, and about 70% of these people actually get involved on the ground, uh, either planting trees or helping do maintenance to the trees that are previously planted and so on. So these guys are actually funding the bulk of the work. They fund the restoration team, they fund Jai, they fund uh, Nosali, um, and so on. Okay, so just to say a few words about our cooperative and how our community, or at least our, as a cooperative, we're rather unique when you talk about community involvement in restoration, because, uh, okay, as a cooperative, we have 340 members from the surrounding four villages. Okay, so as members, they've actually invested in this business, okay? And for the most part, these people have invested uh, to gain employment, yeah, or gain employment for their, their, their children um, and so on. So our core business is actually tourism, okay? Uh, and so we run a homestay program. It's been running since the year 2000. We have um, some uh, forest camps in the jungle. We have a guide service. We have a, a boat service to take people uh, on the Kinabatang River to see the wildlife and so on. So this is, this is the core business. So you might ask, well, why are we actually doing restoration? Well, to be honest with you, the core business is tourism, but our core product is actually uh, restoration. Yeah, and, and going back a long ways, uh, we realized that the people, okay, a couple of things we realized is that uh, grant money runs out really quickly. Yeah, uh, and the, the job of actually keeping uh, the restoration work uh, going uh, back, I'm talking back in 2003, beyond our capacity to try and chase for funding and donors or whatever. So we scaled everything back and started to uh, work with the visitors that are actually, actually coming to our place. So what makes us a little bit different to the other lodges and resorts in the Kinabatangan is that uh, we do this restoration work, right? So people have actually become really interested in that work. 
And why we get these student groups to come to our program, well, one, we have a homestay program, so you, you stay with local people and, and learn the local culture or whatever. Um, but they also get to actually go out and help uh, the restoration work. So, um, and why student groups are um, garnered into this is just because uh, it's, it's just a great exposure. Plus, in the process, they get to learn uh, a lot of science about uh, tropical rainforests, about tropical rainforest ecology, and so on. So the program has basically developed around the product. The, the product is actually developed around the restoration work. Of course, uh, these days we do more than just forest restoration. There's a program to remove invasive waterways and so on and so forth, which we we'll won't get into today. So. Uh, just before I get into the restoration work, uh, we don't work in isolation, right? Uh, over the years, there's been uh, a lot of um, organizations uh, that have been um, supporting our initiative. Uh, obviously, uh, we're one, I mean, obviously, one of the, the earlier ones is the Suburb Forestry Department. Uh, we work with a number of uh, government agencies. Uh, we're a cooperative, so we work closely with the um, SKM, Suranjaya Kokrasi Malaysia. Um, and of course, we have uh, uh, a whole lot of partners, you know, some university partners from Japan, from UK. Um, and then, of course, we have all these organizations over here, which uh, help actually bridge the gap to the world of tourism outside Malaysia. So these, these guys are actually marketing us as a product. They do the heavy lifting of contacting schools and whatever. So we actually work with these businesses to bring tourists to our place. Okay. So uh, just reiterating that point, uh, our business is tourism, our core product is restoration. Okay, so that's kind of scary in a COVID world, right? So now we've tied our conservation to our business, uh, conservation to tourism in particular, then no tourists, then no business, okay? And no tourists, no conservation. Okay, so uh, that's really scary. And this hit us first uh, back in 2013 with the, with the Tandoi crisis here on the east coast of um, Sabah. Um, and believe me, guys, it's not over. I mean, Jap visitors from Japan still won't come to the east coast of Sabah because of the situation here. So there's like a, a line on the map. Uh, we're basically in a danger zone to some of these countries. So tourism, trying our work to conservation, uh, we've had some really big problems associated with that. So over the last year, we've been really, really fortunate. Uh, timing has just a uh, stroke of luck. We've had a number of organizations that have contacted us. Uh, one is the Rigor Borneo Initiative, uh, work is, is Cardiff University, Dunagiro and Field Center. They're trying to offset the carbon for the university. Another one is a Green Steps Group. They actually pay for planting and uh, tree planting initiatives around the world. Okay, so although we don't uh, plant trees, that's not really the end goal for our, our program. We've had to work with these organizations, I mean, with Green Steps. Uh, and of course, we, we've, we're actually actively looking for organizations like Cardiff, um, uh, Dana Gearing Field Center, and, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a short while. Okay, so I'm not gonna dwell on this, but I just wanted to say here that basically our tourism program, we can restore, you know, I mean, if I'm going back like five years, we're looking at like uh, between five to 10 hectares of forest a year, just with our visitors. Okay, uh, if we get uh, external funding, which we have over the years from time to time, uh, different organizations, sub forestry department, uh, some uh, small NGOs from here and there. Uh, uh, so we can actually do more than what our visitors can plan. Um, and to us, we're, of course, we're really proud of it. You know, there's more than 300 over hectares of forest that we've planted, um, you know, it's, it's, it's close to 400,000 trees. So we don't normally dwell on that, but it's, it makes, uh, it's just, it's part of our story and, and it's worth saying. Okay, so I just wanna say a little bit about the Kinabatangan. Okay, so here we are in the lower Kinabatangan, the part in the middle of the map here where you see the area around our community, it's a forest reserve. And there's a, um, a patchwork of forest that actually dot the lower Kinabatangan. So uh, I have to say up until the 1980s, a lot of these areas were actually commercial uh, forest reserves. So there were areas where uh, there was tim I mean, timber, logs being taken out of the forest. Okay, so what we've got now, uh, I mean, in the, in the 1980s, then these areas were earmarked and uh, uh, basically opened up for conversion for farming. Okay, so as that actually started to evolve uh, through the 80s and 90s, uh, some of these areas along, along the floodplain 
were protected for special reasons. So for example, the area that surrounds our community, Pinsable Forest Reserve, is a really special place in terms of uh, uh, forest habitat. And of course there's uh, limestone caves in these areas with uh, the swiftless that make the edible nest. So a uh, great idea to actually protect uh, the industry is to protect the forest around these areas. And other areas along the lower Kinabalingan were, were much later in the nineties was, was started to be uh, talked about in terms of protecting those areas because they're really not suitable for farming. And, and uh, that's because they go underwater, uh, you know, five to eight times a year. Um, and yeah, so those areas were left out from uh, farming initiatives in those in, at those times. Okay, so why I want to say this up front is because you, you see in the lower Kinabatang down here, we've got like 400,000 hectares of land uh, and now protected areas or the areas that are set aside to um, protect the forest and the habitat is, a, is roughly about 40,000 hectares. And, and based on a survey a few years ago, about 50% of it or more is actually degraded forest. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about this forest and why it's so special. So this part of Malaysia is a really, really uh, special part, not just for Malaysia, but for our planet. So here in the lower Kinabatangan, in this remaining forest, we have uh, 10 species of primate in this area. We have all eight hornbill species in this area. Uh, we have 200 over really amazing um, birds. Um, we have a whole bunch of small mammals, which are, just uh, if you look at board, just not just Borneo, but Malaysia and Southeast Asia, I mean, this, this is one of the last, you know, some of these last places where you can actually find uh, all these species. So we have seven species of civet cat, two porcupine species, two otter species. Uh, we have an endemic uh, pig species here, you know, the flying lima, this really, this cool dude, the, what we call the moon rat, uh, two species of mouse deer and so on. So the list goes on and on. All right, and then we have some really amazing uh, forest in this area, which is really special, uh, not just for Kinabdangan, but for Malaysia. Uh, so we have uh, within the forest reserve, the principal forest reserve that surrounds our community, there's uh, six different types of forest in this area. So in terms of diversity, just in terms of plant diversity, it's a really, really special place. And of course, you can see here, we have flooded forests, you know, like the Amazon. Uh, and of course, these uh, freshwater swamp forests, which have uh, unique uh, trees. And in fact, in this area, we have, uh, a number of endangered uh, uh, number of endangered tree species. Okay, so you're probably getting the idea that we, if we start looking through the lens of how amazing this is, and then you go back to the map about how little of this forest is uh, left over, then it might strike you like it did us back in, in the late 90s when uh, we have a year of drought in 97, 98, and this forest is actually going up in, in smoke. Okay, so this was our wake up call. Uh, back in those days. It's like we have this small area of land, it's like really high conservation value. Uh, basically it's really, really special. Yeah, and half of it is actually burnt or degraded. So have we, this, we have this habitat for all this really cool stuff. Yeah, but half of it is, is not functional habitat, okay? All right, and after 20, some year areas after 20 years, some year areas after 40 years, they still look like this. So 40 years after the fires, they're actually still looking like this. So when we talk, look at this, this area from above, we're, we're looking at residual forest after the fires. And this is what we call like, like severe degradation. There's like basically this 90% of the trees are, are lost. And then we have areas like this where you're probably looking at 40, 50% of the trees are lost. Okay, so these are, this is the areas that we're talking about um, uh, restoring in our area. And ground zero, it looks kind of something like this. So you have uh, what's happening here is you have uh, a light opening, you have all these uh, light demanding uh, species of plant that are adapting really, really fast to get up to the top of the canopy like vines uh, to, to reach the light and they don't have the trees to grow on. So they start growing on top of each other. It gets really, really thick, okay? And I have to say here before we move on, it's like uh, we have a problem here in the sense of the forest that we have remaining is that if anyone thinks that tropical rainforest doesn't burn, they are. They are sadly wrong because uh, a very a forest in very good condition possibly won't. We, we're talking about degraded environments here. And there's a really strong message in this picture about uh, not degrading them in the first place. Because as you can see very clearly from, from this area, uh, this is actually uh, now uh, gazetted as a wildlife sanctuary. But basically in these areas before it was gazetted, it was, it was being opened up for farmland, right? So uh, the fire you can see very, very clearly here actually follows the areas that uh, opened up and we have a degraded forest uh, 
uh, we don't have the upper story and the mid story to to actually shade and cool the the lower story when we have a drought period. So if you understand how a tree behaves in the drought, well, when it gets really stressed, it drops the leaves. Okay, so in probably in a in an intact forest like a, a more primary sort of forest, the the forest the leaf litter on the forest floor doesn't dry out so much. So in these degraded areas, that forest uh, leaf litter dries out and it becomes uh, flammable. So we've all seen forest fires around the region. Uh, we know it happens, but uh, this this is dynamic, and these are the areas they're actually working in now to try to restore them. And it's really really hard work. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our restoration story, just from a restoration perspective. Uh, this is an area we started back in 1999, 2000. Uh, this is an area uh, just north of the, the Cowboy Lake in the Pinsable Forest Reserve. You can see on the map here, I mean, this is an aerial photograph uh, back in the day. Uh, it's a very, very open area. Um, so on this map here, it, this uh, yellow area, here, it's probably about 40%, we call it like 40% uh, uh, loss of uh, tree cover. Um, and we it's just a, a, a grading or a classification of how degraded the forest is in that area. Okay, so back in the day, uh, when you go down on the ground, we, it looks like this. So, not, I mean, if you're just starting doing restoration, this is where we were like uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, we go to the experts and ask them, well, what are we supposed to do? So we were told to uh, create lines in this uh, vine thicket, um, plant uh, native trees, okay, in these areas. Uh, and come back four times a year to do maintenance on these trees. So sounds pretty easy, right? So off we went, we started to create our lines. Uh, three months later, we come back uh, and uh, we can't actually find our planting lines. Okay, so when we find our planting lines, we really, uh, and basically they've been smothered by the vines in these areas. Okay, so we find, we find our planting lines and we find like one and a half of the trees that were planted are dying because they've been smothered by the vines. Okay, so we open our vines and then we come back three months later for our second round of maintenance. Uh, the same thing's happening, but it's all completed. Why? We actually went out of water for about five weeks. So guys, it's a wake up, you know, it's like we are working in areas that are seasonally flooded. Some of these areas are seasonally flooded, it's the floodplain. All right, so this really forced us to think, well, if these species aren't adapted to these areas, what species are? So then we actually started to look closely at the forest in these areas, to actually look at the species that's uh, involved, even though we're we're dealing with a pioneer and a native species of the surrounding area, but they're not specific to these sites. Okay, so we started to get a little more success with, with our planting program. We also then started thinking about, well, once we actually start uh, looking, this, this is the areas where we're actually um, working. So you can see here, like when the vines become this thick, if there's any seed penetrating this area, then it's really hard for it to germinate. And there's often not enough light for these this, this, uh, small trees, baby trees to actually um, turn into a bigger tree. Okay, so we decided to like experiment and actually start to do uh, a blanket clearing of vines in these areas. And that would be a really rather interesting results because I mean, as these pictures show here, uh, these little white dots here are areas that, sorry, these little white dots are the trees that we planted and all these other red dots uh, are trees that are regenerating naturally. So over here, these two uh, black trees, that's Lotus muticus, that's trees that we've planted uh, and all these other trees are actually restoring uh, naturally. Okay, so in this area, uh, this is what it looks like today. Okay. And some sometimes people ask us, you know, I mean, is, is this, uh, if we're getting this kind of uh, natural regeneration happening, in a sense, like why are we planting trees? Right? Maybe we should just uh, remove the vines and let, then let nature do the work. Okay, so here's the quandary for us, and this is, I mean, this is of, this is one of the big questions still until today. But I can tell you two very good reasons why uh, that's possibly not a great idea is because like we open up these areas, uh, we're reliant on natural seeding processes. So we have a lot of windborne seed, we're relying on wildlife to bring seed. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then we've still got open areas and we're still maintaining open areas for a long time. So we still do the planting in these areas for that reason. Okay. And then second, very big reason. And to me, I guess from when now you're thinking about our world uh, and our restoration world tourism is that, uh, probably the most scary reason why we still need to plant trees is because if you ask anybody funny to chop vines, they'll say, <laughs> are you crazy? Yeah, but if you ask for something that's something that to people like, like trees, for it. 
And as it turns out, I mean, once we started to do the maths, it's like about 75% of the work is, is start preparation, uh, mine clearing, and stock after we plant the trees. Okay, and, and less than 25% of our money spent is actually on planting the trees. Okay, we have to package the whole restoration process. I mean, the whole, this whole restoration uh, package, you know, under the banner of planting trees. And that's kind of really sad, but that's, that's in some ways where we are with um, restoration, where we are with conservation, uh, where we are with connecting to people. And this kind of seminar today, I think is like really, really important to kind of share uh, alternative images to that. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep moving on now talking about um, the, all the fantastic work on the ground. So uh, the work, no doubt, is a lot about uh, clearing some of the vines off these sites uh, to, so we can actually start uh, a new generation of trees or, or regeneration of trees. So uh, vine chopping is a big part of our program. I hope you can see that. And obviously where there's areas of grass, we start to use uh, sun mechanization and so on. Um, and earlier I had said that these guys are heroes to our program because I mean, look at some of these pictures. Uh, the picture on the top here is an area that's been, uh, that's the first round of uh, vine clearing. And then the second round here down below is, is uh, once they've actually started to actually prepare those areas, second round of preparation for planting in those areas. Uh, here's another shot like that. So the top one is after they've done the first round of vine clearing and the bottom image is those areas now they're actually being ready for planting in those sites. And we're talking about these sites, they have been, uh, I mean, they've been restoring after fire. This particular site was burnt by fire uh, back in the 1980s, okay? And this is the fringe of the forest where you would hope there would be natural regeneration happening. Okay, so uh, we're actually working in these areas like 40 years later, there's, there's, the natural regeneration is not happening. So our initiatives here, uh, uh, I mean, we believe are still very, very important. And we're very fortunate to have, uh, you know, supporters, um, you know, both institutional support from, you know, universities or um, government, but also business support from tourists that, and volunteers that want to travel around the world or even from within Malaysia to come and stay with us. Okay, so like I said, these, these guys are totally amazing. They do really, really amazing work. Okay, and here we are, of course, uh, like I said, we uh, do plant trees. Uh, it's part of the process, All right? Um, and Nos Ali, he's, he's, like I said, the hero of our program. Um, and of course, it's a much bigger team that actually make it all happen, you know, from people that actually organize it. Um, Nos Ali's got a team of people that work in the tree nursery, uh, which you don't see here. Um, and of course, all those guys that do, do that really heavy lifting in the field. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk very, very quickly about some of the before and after shots here. So we have uh, the top picture here is, is an area we call, we call cowboy stumping. Why is because back in the 1980s, this was a log dumping ground before they actually load the logs onto barges on the Kinabatangan River. Um, and this is 2006. So pretty much uh, 20, 30 years after this was utilized, there's very little regeneration on the site and that's because of compacting, so on and so forth. So we clear back the vegetation. Like I said, these, these are some of the heroes that do the really hard work. Uh, it looks like that before planting. Um, I haven't got, I can't squeeze in another picture here without making it um, not so visible, but this is about a year after planting. And today, so this is on the left side, this is this area we call cobble stumping uh, back in 2007 when we're just clearing, getting ready for planting. And today it looks something like this. Okay, so this is, uh, this is our, one of our showcases. I mean, like I said earlier, back in uh, 1999, we've had some like massive failures. Okay, but we've learned from those mistakes and started to adapt and change our techniques. This specific, this particular site, we started to um, experiment with a much closer planting. So instead of planting at a three meter, uh, we're actually pushing it up to like a, a one meter density. So what that means in terms of how many trees you plant per hectare, at three meters, you're looking at about 900 trees per hectare. At one meter, you're talking about 10,000 trees per hectare. And you might be saying, well, that's crazy. Well, actually, when you look at uh, forest regenerating naturally around lake fringes and whatever, it's actually uh, regenerating naturally at that sort of density. And it's when the trees can actually get a, a closed canopy that they can actually shade out the other weeds and vines as they're establishing. And of course, these weeds and vines, you can't actually get rid of them. They're part of the um, habitat and ecology. So they actually end up coming back in a bit later on. So this particular site, we planted uh, about 12 species. We've got a plot over here, which had five species. 
um, which is our carbon plot right now, uh, today it's got about it's got a, it's got more than thirty species in that site right today. Okay, um, and we've got camera traps set up in this site. So here's some of the wildlife that we see coming through our restoration sites. So we've got um, proboscis monkey there daily. We've seen orangutan coming through here, pigtail macaque. Um, here's a banded palm civet, um, banded linsang. Our friend, the uh, crested fireback. Uh, Tingalong here, civet cat, uh, moon rats, uh, pangolin. We've got the yellow throated martin, that's not me. Uh, uh, mongoose here, and we've got uh, Pumba from Lion King as well. So we've got lots of them around this place. Okay, so this is just some wildlife that's uh, coming into the restoration uh, sites now. Okay, so here's another area that we've been working on. Uh, this started much later in 2013, so it's a riparian site. Uh, this plantation had been growing their palm up to the riverbank. Uh, it's actually a riparian reserve, so the government stepped in when they, they started to do the replanting of their palm, second, second rotation, uh, and asked them to not plant back that area. And then uh, we were approached to help uh, plant that up. So yeah, look, the bottom right here, this area is actually starting to look, at, look like this today. So this is planted by our uh, community. It's also planted by visitors. So our communities come through um, in 2014, 15. 2015, we had uh, a really long drought period here. Uh, we've had a very high mortality. So our tourism program has come and backed it up. So we keep planting up those areas, uh, just keep planting them up, uh, areas that are next, uh, not, not successful. Uh, and over the last uh, five or six years, we can actually start to see a forest like that. Okay, so recapping a little bit, I've talked about a little bit about uh, our team and our cooperative. Uh, I've talked a little bit about why restoration in this area is, is so special. And I've talked a little bit about uh, the restoration work. So where are we uh, today and, and where are we going? Well, um, minutes, yeah, Martin. Really, we got how much time? Just two minutes. Two, two minutes, minutes, okay. All right, so uh, just winding things up here. Uh, We have basically a couple of things happening in parallel here. Our organization uh, got married with the Suburb Forestry Department back in 2009. So we have an agreement with the state government to help uh, co-manage this forest reserve. Uh, second round of uh, management planning, 10-year uh, management planning, we signed an agreement, an MOA with the state government in 2017, a 10-year agreement to basically continue that work. So we're, in, we're sort of uh, given the role of uh, monitoring the eyes and ears uh, as much as actually helping rest restore this area, help protect this area. Um, and we fund that through taking tourists into this area, okay? Uh, so if you look at this, um, so part, part of that agreement is to, we have, we have some obligations to monitor the work that we're doing in this area. Okay, one is to actually monitor the impacts of our restoration work, which is great. So we actually are now are monitoring closely your success at restoration in terms of, is it actually providing habitat for wildlife? Uh, and hence the camera trapping and, and that sort of initiative. We also monitor water quality and so on. Now, out of that, we've, we've actually uh, had, as a community, we're not, in a sense, not uh, scientists, we're you know, citizen scientists or whatever, but uh, we've had to reach to, you know, to universities and people with technical know-how to actually help us here. So one of the early ones was the university from Japan. Uh, initially, they were sending uh, students here every year, and then they, they decided to get some funding to help us uh, set up our monitoring programs, to help with uh, establishing the camera trapping, the water quality, uh, and so on. Uh, and more recently, we've, we've had this initiative with uh, Cardiff University through the Rigo Borneo Initiative and the Danalgarian Field School. So it's like carrying on this sort of thing. So we're reaching out uh, with this kind of uh, support with our monitoring work. Uh, as it turns out, in terms of the tourists, uh, yeah, um, they're actually really interested in, in participating in all of this stuff. When you start talking science to school teachers, then they get really um, uh, passionate or really interested about having their students participate in this. So we've got uh, volunteers, a growing program of having volunteers. Uh, we've got interns every year that come and join our program. You know, as part of their university program, they have to do a couple of months of uh, work. So we, we have interns coming to help us out. But basically the direction that we're going is not, we're not actually moving away from restoration because per se, but we're actually um, trying to move our program to be more knowledge-based. Um, and you see from this map here that, uh, you know, we've got about just around our community, we've got over 2,200 hectares of degraded forest, okay? And the area that I showed you on the map earlier, that's this bit here, it's not degraded anymore, okay? And the areas that, uh, that are still degraded, they're increasingly further away from the river, 
Okay, and those areas surprisingly further away from the river, they actually go underwater more. So we're working in uh, uh, increasingly challenging habitats. So understanding how to restore those areas, uh, we really have to like almost go back um, to the to the beginning and start actually doing experiments, uh, starting learning what, what you know what approaches. So we're not going for like big grand uh, restoration, uh, you know, hundreds of hectares or you know hundreds of thousands of trees here. We want to target like one hectare, ten hectares, you know, something that's actually we're actually working on different techniques in these areas. And we because obviously we realize that even after twenty years, there's so many things we do not know. Okay, so. Um, and in the process, of course, uh, our team then is also moving into this, these uh, more monitoring activities. So if I say some of the sad parts of our program, you know, 20 years ago, we did not document properly our work, okay? And we have like three or four uh, team members that, you know, their computers died or the hard drive died and all the data's gone. Okay, so we're kind of rebuilding that. Um, you know, three or four years ago, we started establishing these permanent uh, sample plots again. Um, and now we're actually tagging the trees that we plant. So you can see a picture of that here. Um, and of course, we've established some carbon plots here with the, with the help of Danagar and Field Center and so on uh, to actually monitor the carbon that we're sequestering through our, um, through our restoration program. Plus, this is a way of monitoring the other species that's actually the succession and the other species that's actually coming into this area. So, um, and of course, our uh, like I said, we're, we're basically moving in that in that direction right now. So I think in summary, if I just want to uh, sum things up, uh, if you haven't already looked at it, the Habitat Foundation website, the 10 golden rules, it really resonates. Uh, it was only shared with us recently, but uh, it really resonates with what we do. Um, you know, rule number one, don't destroy it in the first place. You know, if you have, like us, if you have to actually do something about it, you know, that involves uh, people, it involves understanding there is that you're planting, uh, understanding the species and so on, that you actually are, are native to those areas in a sense, like that's the habitat that evolved to grow in um, is really, really important to that work. And of course, um, any, any funding mechanisms that you guys can garner to help your work. I mean, the 100 million trees to us is, is inspiring, you know, even though we don't, uh, we, you know, we, we don't advocate tree planting directly, it's only a small part of our work. But even so, I mean, this, this gets people interested uh, in planting trees um, and hopefully we can all get more support either through tourism and so on. So have a look at those 10 golden rules. Uh, and if, you, if COVID ever finishes, uh, I invite all of you uh, to come and visit us if you've got a community come we have some great sharing programs with other communities uh, and uh, yeah so if you're, if you're a research institution we welcome you to come and actually support our program uh, that's it from me today thank you all very much thanks Martin that's awesome thank right. you so much Martin um, so we have one question for you from Abraham um, and he's asked always inspired to hear the Coppel story thanks for sharing uh, what are some of the impacts of climate change on your rest on the restoration project and you briefly mentioned droughts is there anything else ah so that's that's a tricky one if, I mean if normally if we ask that question uh, the first droughts and fires in this area were in the 1960s, at least documented. Uh, then we had the 1980s, and then we had 1989. So you're looking at like a 15 to 20 year sort of time frame. And then 1989, we had 2015, 16. And then we've had like the last two years. So are these events getting more frequent? Look, I don't know. But we're talking about a forest here that's been degraded. And when a forest is degraded, when there's a, an extended drought, I mean, these droughts could have been happening for a long time, right? Uh, then they become... Uh, really uh, susceptible to fire, okay? And it's like a perpetuating story. So you burn it, it restores, and then it burns again and restores. And we're talking about like, basically we're talking about desertification, you know, the bigger picture here. So um, uh, climate change is really tricky one. I mean, we can't see it directly, but of course uh, we've, I mean, just based on rainfall data over the last 10 years, rainfall is decreasing. I mean, if you look at the last two years here, uh, we're 160 kilometers, 163 kilometers from the start of the delta, right? That's not even from the sea. And last year, the river went backwards. It's tidal here, 163 miles from the sea. It's actually tidal. So last year, it almost went backwards more than it went downstream, okay? And our boat engines, which are parked in the river, are actually, it's almost like you're in a marine environment. You tip them out of the water and you, you, they were like corroded on the bottom of the boat because you have this saltwater intrusion. So uh, climate change, uh, our restoration work, we're just working hard. It's, it's really hard to comment exactly. Uh, at this point. Okay, thanks Martin for that answer. Um, 
And um, if you, if it's okay, we're just going to stop sharing your screen. Um, and I'd like to hand over the floor to um, Justine. Um, she'd like to say a few words. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to share this with with you. Um, I think that uh, everybody woke up this morning with the sad news that we've lost Balu Paramal. And I, I think wanted to say um, that that Balu was a pioneer in conservation, and he was one of the first people that really championed community-led conservation. So uh, we wanted to say to honor his life and his work. Uh, yep, take over. <laughs> And unmute. Thank you, Justin. Um, yeah, uh, it was kind of hard to, to get into a webinar mode this morning uh, for us uh, in the Malaysian Nature Society and also all of us in the secretary, we received um, the sad news of the passing of our colleague, uh, Mr. Balu Perumal, uh, this early this morning. He had a long fight. Uh, with COVID and uh, we were optimistic that he was out of the ICU and recuperating but perhaps uh, a couple of hours early this morning maybe things took for the worse. So today we lost our uh, head of department. I lost my friend, we lost a mentor and uh, we are doing, MLS is doing the best it can to support the family in this time of need. For those of us who know Balu, I think the, the only way to cherish his memory, uh, his friendship, remembering his uh, wisdom, the knowledge that he shared, is to perhaps to continue to do what we do best in the area of our work. And um, yeah. And and to 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 just continue the work, yeah, in memory of Balu. Thank you. Can I say something, Justin? Yeah, I was just gonna call on you. All right. Okay, I've known Balu Parumal <clears throat> for almost twenty five years. <laughs> it's very difficult to compose yourself when you have lost such a good friend, a fellow conservationist. <clears throat> who has given <clears throat> a lot to conservation. I first <clears throat> met Balu when I was in WWF in the mid 1990s. And uh, Martin, those were the days when I went for the mascot <laughs> program. Uh, the initial Coppel work that started in the, in the late 90s. Balu was a kind man, and he was such a good person. So as Yap said, and Justin said, it was quite difficult to go into this webinar today, uh, listening to uh, the sad news of his passing. Okay, and I, <laughs> for those who are too young to know Balu, I was with him in WWF, and when I was the executive director in MNS, I invited him <laughs> To join MNS to head uh, to head the conservation uh, unit, and uh, and as as Yap has mentioned this morning, he has served in many capacities in many NGOs, conservation NGOs. Uh, that <clears throat> there's not many people that has done what he has done. He was in WWF, GEC, Wetlands, MNS. You know, and uh, because he's such low key and uh, very private that we don't hear of his work, you know, but uh, we we all in the conservation uh, fraternity, we will miss him. And I agree with you uh, to remember him is to continue the work that he was passionate in. And hopefully uh, he rests well in the other boat. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, guys. I am at the verge of breaking down. Okay. Justin, you know, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the the I mean, the quest. I mean, uh, it, it's really. I mean, I'm so heartened to be here with, uh, especially Martin. Right. We both started out in WDF in Sabah together. My first job out of university was the Kinabatangan. And uh, we were work experimenting with a youth project that would then become Coppel. And the fact that there's longevity is, is indicative of the staying power. Lots of projects could easily pack up, you know, and I think they probably would have packed up many times over if not for the resilience and the determination of people. Right, so people, whether individually or communities, they are going to make the difference in conservation. So I mean to say that in an inspiring way and uh, to thank all of you for your contributions. Uh, they haven't come uh, without a cost. Um, so now is a really good opportunity. Some questions have happened in the chat about how okay. to learn, right? Afsa, you wanted to, so Martin, do you want to say something? Oh no, I'm going to ask Afsa to talk about how people can learn about uh, planting methods even inside cities. So Afsa, just chime in and talk about Almina perhaps. Yeah. So thank you guys for all the kind words for Mr. Balu. I think a really great way to honor him and the work that he's doing is to continue to carry on that torch um, of inspiration and inspiring others um, for further conservation efforts. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to share um, uh, with you guys uh, uh, our latest, um, uh, I can't find the word, our latest um, public outreach facility. Um, so we've just opened, um, well, Simon Derby Properties has just opened the Elmina City and we, TRCRC are the operators of the Rainforest Knowledge Center. So this Rainforest Knowledge Center, um, the aim is to invite the urban communities and the surrounding local community um, to learn about forest conservation and how, you know, getting their hands dirty and, you know, and hopefully even um, some networking to understand how to activate um, and join a restoration or conservation effort. So I'm just gonna share a video with you guys. So yeah, that's just to introduce um, one of the many programs that we'll be running. So um, as part of the Albina Rainforest Knowledge Center, we've also activated a community interest group, um, which is called the Voluntary Diptera Carp Seed Project. Um, so here, there'll be a little bit more technical training on seed collections, um, nursery management. Um, our next upcoming workshop for um, this series of training um, will be Diptera Carps 101. Um, so my colleague Tashwini is um, in this in this uh, ch uh, chat box today, um, and she'll be talking about how to distinguish between the different diptera carp species. Um, so that will be the next workshop coming up. Um, so past workshops um, have been done on seed collection protocols, um, and if you are interested to um, join in on these, uh, the mailing list to hear a little bit more and um, keep. Um, yeah, so basically get all the announcements of all the events and programs that will happen. Um, just please register in the link that I've just um, put in the chat box below. Um, Justine, you're on mute. Okay, so the uh, recently, so this, there have been a number of webinars organized with Ketza and FRIM and JPSM. I think those uh, continue to be live and are available for review on their Facebook Live. I think if anyone's curious about some of the more technical things. Um, and I guess the campaign uh, is, is driving 
uh, attention to restoration, but I think it shouldn't, we have all highlighted the need to ensure protection first of what we've got, and that story needs to be told. But um, we are hoping that by helping you understand uh, how to make restorations more, more restoration initiatives more inclusive, more sustainable, more meaningful, we want those trees to be alive uh, two months, two years down the road, right? So let's not obsess with numbers, but let's give our habitats the best chance to succeed. Uh, and in many of these cases, they may even include you, right? Wherever you are, whoever you, you know you work with, whatever you do. There, there must be a restoration story in your life, you know, whether it's urban rewilding or uh, making your own kabun kachil, uh, that all these things have a role to play. Uh, so we've got any more questions now, because there, there are some technical questions and I think possibly we might ask our panelists to engage uh, with you directly with a very, very specific questions, but um, any, um, any other specific comments that you'd like to make? Um, yeah. Can I just reply to one question uh, yeah. about, about whether this work done by NGO communities, uh, state, uh, all coordinated, uh, you know. So uh, <clears throat> for the time being, there is no coordination. But uh, webinars such as this will draw out uh, more uh, awareness to the work that other people are doing. Maybe uh, after this, uh, there would be some effort between people who are involved in community-based uh, nurseries and, and restoration uh, to come together in some form of a platform so that we can coordinate and also reach out to other uh, communities and other people that, that, that wants to uh, be involved. Uh, maybe... Uh, we can have a discussion with uh, Habitat Foundation and TRCRC, MNS. There are, uh, there are quite a few urban, uh, you know, just because you are not staying in forested areas doesn't mean you can't get involved in restoration. You know, uh, MNS, TRCRC has urban centers uh, that are dedicated to outreach uh, to the general public. Uh, so yes, uh, let's learn from each other. And uh, let's see whether a uh, more coordinated effort can be done. Uh, I just want to say that. Okay, thank you, Sean. So I've picked out a couple questions um, from the chat box um, as we've gone along. Um, so there's some technical questions that um, are directed to um, the number of different speakers. Um, so one of the questions that was asked to um, Dr. Noor, are replanting sites also possible research sites? where scientists and graduate students can come in to ask research questions, to learn about sustainable methods, to redevelop other areas, to establish biodiversity of the area. Question for Dr. Noor. Mm -hmm. uh, for a start, the site that we, the, the proposed planting sites that we have in Royal Belum, we haven't figured out about collaboration with research partners, just because of the limitation of getting people in. Um, but there are opportunity to work with uh, researchers in our site in Banon and also in Mersuli when the restriction uh, um, travel is is um, is uplift. Um, but I think uh, in terms of research uh, partnership, Martin has welcomed a lot of uh, researchers to come to because their sites are more established. Um, in our case, we are happy to brainstorm ideas for now but we haven't started planting in the Royal Bloom itself. So it'll be a few more months or years before we can start seeing the results of successful um, survival rate of those seedlings. Yeah, thanks Dr. Noor. Um, okay, can, can I just add that for Royal Bloom, we, we welcome any research work. And I think uh, with the RCRC, we have started over a year, one half years, and uh, they have taken, uh, seedlings from uh, from Royal Bloom into their nursery. And one of the things that I, I am interested in, and if there are any other researchers that 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 uh, that is interested in this particular specific topic, is the resiliency of the seeds from a pristine, uh, strong gene pool area like uh, Royal Bloom. Uh, we've seen that the, the seeds that we've taken, I think Dr. Noor, maybe you can, uh, you can add this. The seeds that's taken from uh, strong gene pools in uh, in pristine forests has shown that they are more resilient 
they are stronger, you know, and uh, maybe there's some studies there to see that, you know, um, to get better and more resilient seeds, you know, than in, in secondary forests. Yep, uh, just to uh, give like general observation that we saw in the nursery, um, based on the seeds that we bought from the Jahai community, I think at the moment it's still early to tell because the trocop are generally slow growing. But um, the most obvious results that we see is we also get some seeds uh, from the elephant poo from me. And you can tell that the, the seeds coming from the elephant poo are just much, much better than the other seeds that we use normal medium, normal planting medium. So somehow, like, you know, the elephant poo really provides very nice microbial environment and all the nutrients to kickstart the seedlings. You, so you can see, I think in my the first slide that I show, all the bushy trees, they're coming from the elephant poo that was given to us by me. So growing media helps, uh, but in terms of uh, general observation of the seedlings, we need more years to see how they're doing because they are generally slow growing for the deep trocop. Okay, thanks. Um, one more question. Um, uh, uh, on his hand up though. Sorry. Ah, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, just to add on to Dr. No, no, she's absolutely spot on and in the sense that, as I said, you know, uh, seeds that come out from the hornbill after it has gone in and it comes out again, whether it's through the front or through the back, doesn't matter. Uh, it seems to have a better chance of germinating. So it is not surprising that other, other frugivores or omnivores, elephants, tapir and, and whatnot, you know, uh, seeds that has been in their pool would also stand a better chance of uh, germination. That's, that's how amazing uh, nature is you know without without us helping so much animals just have to eat it come out to the front come out to the back you get a tree somewhere so i think uh, we can learn a lot of lessons from there so you are if you want the habitat while we restore habitats you know in a human way and you still want to keep it that way we also have to make sure that the wildlife is also there you know call it the forest Planters, farmers, you know, be it birds or mammals. Yeah. So, so not just plant tree, trees and then you might not have a lot of wildlife left. That's also another challenge. Yeah, thanks. Um, so another question directed, um, well, I guess it would, it would be for, I mean, all three of you can answer again, um, is in, in the aim of providing alternative income streams, um, how are the seedling buyback prices set and by whom? And does the working group of Orang Aslis also get compensated for nursery operations? Maybe start with Shah. Okay, um, I can only speak about uh, our projects in Royal Bloom. I, I can't speak of other projects. But uh, basically the way it works is that the buyback depends much on uh, the sponsors. You know, the kind of budget they have, the kind of capacity in terms of them paying. Uh, in Royal Balloon, we do set a standard price uh, for, for the trees, uh, for, the, uh, for the seedlings. But at the end of the day, uh, we have to understand where the sponsors are coming in and what kind of budget they have. So we work within uh, different sponsors in different things. For example, with TRC recently with the Hong Kong group, uh, they buy back at quite a low price, right? However, they also pay for replanting. So when you add the replanting uh, cost and the buyback of the seedlings, then the price becomes uh, very reasonable. So uh, it depends on how you formulate the program with the sponsors to buy back. Uh, that's, that, that's basically our experience uh, in Royal Globe. I think with regards to the, the Habitat Foundation support, the, the funding, the grant funding has been to get things rolling, right? A lot of it's been put into training, uh, the purchase of nursery setup, uh, travel, moving around, and all of those setup costs have been taken in by the grant. Uh, only subsequently will we actually start to see trees, but I think fun, some funds went to, to seed purchase, just so that there's money flowing in and people feel encouraged and getting a nudge and uh, feeling a little bit of a positive reinforcement like this is really working. In community-based work, consistency, 
which means uh, say what you're going to do and do what you say is number one. And uh, I think for the foundation, we will continue for years to come, uh, continue to provide money for buybacks. And so you, money funnels to us will 100% go towards these buybacks. Yeah, uh, Noor, I think you wanted to say something more, right? Can, can I just add something to what you just said, uh, Justin? Yes. So there are very, various stages and various income streams. Uh, for example, in Royal Bloom, it starts with uh, seed collection and buying seeds. Mm. So basically, uh, the orang asli does seed collection and then the seeds are bought from them. Okay, so that there is a price uh, for them to collect and buying of the seed. Uh, some of the seeds that has been bought uh, are taken by the buyers uh, to their own plots. But most of them uh, give back the seed to the orang asli uh, for them to plant in the nurseries. So they don't receive anything uh, while they plant, but upon success successfully planting the seeds in their nurseries, there is a guaranteed buyback you know, from the seeds that, that has already been paid for. You know, so uh, once the seedling reach, you know, two, two, three feet high, uh, strong enough to be re, uh, replanted, it is again bought back from the orang asli. So uh, we have to show, the orang asli has to show commitment by looking after the trees. Uh, that's where the training comes in so that to ensure that uh, from the seeds to the seedlings, uh, they are properly uh, cared for and technically planted. And uh, so you have to, then they'll get paid upon the success of the seedlings that they cared for. Thank you. It's already 12 p.m. <laughs> Time has flown. Time has flown. Yeah. Um, right. If it's okay to have maybe one more question, um, I think this is quite a good question. Um, I think Dr. Here. Noor wants to, to add in a little bit, maybe two minutes. Yeah, if, actually, oh, if, just, if the listeners are okay to stay on, um, and you we know, will stay on, yes. We'll yeah. stay on. So, like, you can just drop out as you need to leave, and then we'll just answer as many questions as we can, if that's okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to add that uh, the whole pricing uh, mechanism is still and uh, like um, developing. So we are discussing with State Park on how best pricing, what, how to determine based on size, based on species. So, for example, for diptocarp or the the rare species you would pay more than uh, the typical fruit trees that you can easily find just because we need to um, diversify the kind of species that we are encouraging the orang asli to pick. So for example, maybe for Chin, because he was focusing on hornbill seeds, then that's his uh, target uh, collection. But for, for our uh, for the RCRC interest, we are mostly focusing on the rare, endangered and threatened diptrocarp species just because we know how uh, precious these are, and we have access to these species in Royal Belum. That's what depends really on the species that we are targeting on. And we would love to learn more from Martin and from other people who are already way ahead in terms of setting up the mechan uh, mechanism for the seed pricing on how to set up the co cooperative, for example. Great, so um, the next question will be to Martin. So this is kind of two questions in one. Um, so Martin, you mentioned one meter planting as a better outcome and establishment than three met meter planting centers. Is this your recommended planting space now or does it depend on the type of forest being restored? Um, and also while you answer that, there's someone else who's also asked the question about planting in um, like in rows and columns. Um, and I, my response is that TRCRC does cluster um, planting, but maybe perhaps you can answer the way that you, the methods and strategies that you've employed at Coppel. Okay, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, at the moment, we're planting a two, I mean, uh, at the, generally speaking, if it's a talk generalization, it's a two to 2.5 meter spacing, all right? Uh, but certain sites, especially if we're, because now we're experimenting with pole planting in some of the really waterlogged sites. Um, and in so, some sites, if I show you the results, you'd be like really like amazed. And in other sites, we're getting like really high mortality. So uh, that, that's sort of the driving, like I was saying earlier about driving, wanting to have more research uh, re more partnerships with, with researchers to actually help us understand why, why some sites are working, why some sites are not working and so on. Um, but uh, gen if I said generally speaking, it's probably about a two meter spacing. So why do I say that? It's because 
uh, some of the trees that we're planting have really small crowns. Okay, if you're having, if you're planting a tree that has a relatively big crown, then you can think about planting them further apart. Um, plus, then you've got to think about your maintenance costs. So, ideally, we want to have the crown of the trees like uh, meet up. Ideally, within about a year. I mean, that's like I, ideal. So, I mean, if we're working about uh, you know from planting until the end of next year, then you're probably looking at a two two years of maintenance. Uh, given that maintenance is the bigger cost. Uh, uh, depending on the species, depending on the site, will kind of determine a little bit uh, how, how we space them. Um, so that's kind of more the actual answer. Although if you just wanted to go for a generalization, we found that uh, planting at one meter spacing uh, is, is too close, although it worked really well on one particular site. Um, planting three meters, uh, you, you're gonna have years and years of maintenance, uh, depending how well those uh, trees actually uh, grow in the first like three years. Um, I mean, in some of our sites, if we're closing like really close to the river, then you, you'd probably get away with three meters because they're not going to get flooded. But most of a lot of our other sites are, are flooded, so we, we get mortality and so on from from uh, the small trees being underwater. So uh, yeah, so we we have them closer together so they can actually meet up the canopy uh, quicker. I think there's just one thing I wanted to add, which uh, you touched on vaguely, because um, both of you talked about the micro. A microbiome of elephants and hornbills. The other thing to imagine is the things that are needed but we don't see, which is the soil bi biomes, the, the microbes in the soil. And this is one of the key elements that needs further research. You can't just plonk any tree anywhere. It doesn't have the friendly bi bio microbes that it needs to germinate and so on, right? So this is why uh, and scientists are finding that you have to to work with the same soil with its adjacent species, it's quite critical. Otherwise, you're basically spinning your tires, your wheels. You're not getting anywhere because you don't have all of the picture of what's needed for that tree to grow and thrive. Yeah. So, more, so more soil scientists, please. We need your input because there's still a lot that we don't know, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Mm. Can, can I just add? Mm. Uh, it is easy to. I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to generalize uh, uh, restoration Be, uh, as, and also communities. There's no one generic uh, formula for us to work. You really need to know the site, the, the, the landscape that you're working with, the species that you're working with, and also the community you work with. Different community respond differently. Uh, when we talk about orang asli, we tend to generalize orang asli as just orang asli, but they're not. They, there are 18 uh, tribes, and within the tribes, at different locality, they have different culture, traditions, and values. You know, so uh, there's no generic answer. You have to be on the ground, working with the soil and the people to really understand what works and what, what doesn't work. And, and to, 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 to have it uh, be successful, you need to have some technical knowledge. That's where uh, technical partners like TRCRC and researchers and whatnot has to come in because there's no uh, magic formula for, for things to do. And yes, Justin, the soil conditions and the plants and the seeds that you collect plays a critical role. You know, we have seeds that, uh, that is why the seeds that's collected in Royal Bloom is given back to the Orang Asli in Royal Bloom to, to plant for seedlings because the soil condition, the microbials and everything else uh, works for, for, for those species. I have had seeds taken back to Frim and they died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just couldn't grow, and mm -hmm. and free as the best technical people to help to help uh, germinate the seeds, but it doesn't work because they don't use the soil from Royal Bloom. So uh, please, uh, there's no magic formula. You really have to do uh, go on the on your soil and on your people to make it work. Yeah, like, yeah. Like Martin, you you've got. Uh, you've got flood plains, Martin. I mean, not not all places uh, face flood plains, and those are different kind of challenges. Definitely, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and one question for 
yeah, so I think this is a good one for you to take. Um, so I'm just curious to know, since the Indigenous communities are so crucial to help empower these amazing conservation efforts and strategies, may I know what are the challenges faced when approaching these communities in the first place? And did the people, did the Indigenous people see um, directly the positive outcomes of the conservations and accept the idea? So I understand that, you know, with your Hornbill conservation, you know, it started off with wildlife and now it's moving towards um, more towards like nursery and planting material and um, restoration for hornbills. So perhaps you can share from your experience um, any challenges that you faced. That's not a question, that's a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. That's a seminar for all four of us to do another seminar. <laughs> uh, right, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll just try to shrink it a bit. Lah, okay? I think we work with people, right? It's, 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 people don't always accept uh, immediately uh, your ideas. You know? even, even if you're not an orang asli, right? So for us, when we first started the Hornbill project, uh, it's, it's a very straightforward um, go and meet the orang asli, uh, talk a bit, you know, get to know them. Uh, would you like to work with us uh, um, uh, uh, in doing, you know, Honda surveys and all that? So, so they probably think, uh, okay lah, that guy got money ma. Uh, go work with the fellow. So it started from from that onwards. That honestly, it started from that onwards, and then slowly over the years, if you continue to work with the same community, the same team, the same individual, then hopefully those kind of uh, early beginnings develop into something more genuine. Uh, friendship, teamwork, understanding, mutual respect. Um, so it is a very long journey and each community will have a different um, um, uh, acceptance. Uh, even within the, the Belum Temango landscape itself. You know, the Belum Temango landscape has 30 hours village. We just work with one or two. So it's a long-term thing. Uh, get get to 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 know them, and then uh, from there we develop into something more. Um, uh, we we develop better better relationship. We develop the work together. Uh, for example, as I said, um, our Hombil Guardians. Um, it's not just doing mechanical work. I I want to make sure that what they do, they understand the principles behind it, and they can share their point of view also as well from the eyes of, of an orang asli because I sure am not staying in, orang, in Belum Temugo 24 hours a day, you know, uh, and don't understand the forest as much as I would like, like how an orang asli does. So every month we talk about our work, we plan our work together, and, uh, and we at the end of the month, we also see what's the result. But at the end of the year, we also look, it, look at the 12 months that have passed, what we have achieved, what is this data trying to tell us? You know, the phenology, for example, you know, uh, could they tell me that when are they going to fruit the, 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 the trees? Uh, so say, oh, this month, that month. Uh, so as a scientist, you, you, you start thinking, oh my God, I have no idea in this case. So we did design something, and then with their input, and then we put that through the motion. At the end, we have, we have some idea right now. Then their ideas, their thoughts, their understanding can slowly fit into the, the puzzle uh, that we are trying to, to solve. So, and unfortunately, as I said, there's no silver bullet in dealing with community. I come from a wildlife background, but through this journey, it also became, became a personal journey it is not just about wildlife, it's also about people, and people are difficult. But people, you can also, people create problems, people can also solve problems. So I would say that if you want to work with communities, you have to, or you should get to know the community first. I mean, if immediately you go in and say, I got this job, you know, it can be just a strict direct transaction. But if you really want to build a genuine uh, relationship, it's going to take time, it's going to take costs, it's going to take resources. So think carefully before you want to, want to be involved in a community. And for me, 
uh, my general rule is that we don't we don't make promises that we cannot deliver. I've heard too What's many. Going on? I I I I've made I've I've listened to too many times already. Uh, uh, you know, conversations with my team. People come in not to say with bad intentions, but they have intention, but they unfortunately cannot carry out. So they they are no longer in the landscape, but the people are still in the landscape. So people, a different NGO might come in and you know want to do the same thing. They might remember, or oh, the other fellow also promised the same thing, but then they never deliver. Then you are saying the same thing also as well. So so I think uh, build a genuine relationship. Don't 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 promise anything, and then see how that develops further, lah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just want to add something. You know, in the same way that. You know, I've also been doing community-based conservation since I started. And this, in the same way that when we have a success, it doesn't automatically mean that it's going to, the same thing is going to work anywhere else. It's going to have to be tailored and customized just as your plant meets the biotic environment of that soil, right? Yep. Why do we think it's going to be anything different? We People are just people just like you and me, and, and we don't always get along either, right? However, what seems to happen more frequently, and I really feel that we need to not do this anymore, is when people say, oh, I tried that one time in 1985 to work with communities and it failed. Hence, therefore, from now on, all, all community-based things are not viable because they are not reliable, they're not trustworthy, they're not hardworking. What mm. bullshit, basically. Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, like, why, why do we have such unfair rules, like, out of bounds and you're out? Out forever you know it's nonsense yeah. it, communities are just the same as you and me right yeah and, uh, I, I and think there's a very high heterogeneity about it right yeah, i think i think for participants who will listen i think it's also crucial to remember that while we have shown the work that we have done you know there is also there were also cases that we actually have failed in the past mm. yeah. so as i said failures is pain failures are painful failures are costly and failures are sometimes demoralizing, but it is perhaps an essential part of learning, provided if we want to learn. Then, then we, we, we learn the lessons from there. And hopefully when we start anew, uh, we will not go down that uh, path again. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something, Justin? Yes. <laughs> okay, being, being, the, being, being the eldest in this whole yeah. webinar, <laughs> Yeah, we're, throwing, we're throwing age, age now, before uh. beauty. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, for any conservation work to be truly sustainable long term, you need to involve the community. Because conservationists, researchers, me, you, everybody come and everybody go, but the community stays. So for real conservation, where the community that stays there forever, uh, you need to involve the community and you need to embed within the community uh, the knowledge of conservation. They have a knowledge of conservation in a traditional way, but you also need to uh, share with them uh, some modern views in terms of conservation, uh, which I tell you, they can buy in. Okay, second point is um, you cannot do conservation uh, when the community is hungry. Yes. If conservation doesn't work in empty stomach. Yes. If the community is hungry, they don't have resource, they don't, they don't have money, they don't have income, you can talk all the conservation things you want, they're not going to buy it because uh, they want their, in their head, is thinking about how to feed my family, how to get milk for my children, how to get rice for, for, for tonight. So, the best way is go through their stomach, meaning you have to make uh, the program a viable program where they can earn income. So they might start with uh, participating in the program because they, they is revenue generating. And this also in lower Kinabata, I, I remember talking to Khatija and people of, of the Nestle uh, projects in lower Kinabata. It all starts with them having a revenue stream by planting a seedlings. But over time, they start to understand why they plant the seed, why they need to do the seedling. When they actually replant and look after the plants, then they come to love the plants that they plant. And now if you go into some of these areas, 
you know, they'll anybody suspicious coming in, they'll say, What are you doing here? Are you are you trying to destroy my forest? Are you trying to cut my trees? Because it starts with the revenue, because you cannot do conservation on an empty stomach. But once they are slightly comfortable, there is revenue, and they learn about the, the reasons behind why they're planting. The, the, the money becomes secondary. Primary has already become, the primary reason is, all, is already conservation. That's how you build into, into the society. So the income generation part of the revenue from, from the project is an important component for the buy-in. And thirdly, I just want to say that you don't need to start a project with the whole village saying yes. You need just a few local champions. You just need three or four, even two, you know, people saying, yes, I want to be with you. And these are people who trust us, who, are, who already work with us before, like your humble guardians. You know, like in my case, we only started with a handful, maybe three or four people in, in, in Kampong Klewang who wanted to do it, you know, because they've done stuff with us before. But once they show success, once they start having revenue, then the other people will see. And now you have all the other kampongs wanting to join in. So you just need to find the champions that starts the work with you, show the result. And lastly, yes, yeah, deliver your promise. If you can't promise, keep quiet. Because if you promise, especially the indigenous people, the orang kampong, the, the aslis, if you promise and you don't deliver on your promise, uh, it's very difficult for them to, to, to accept your, your programs later on. Because these people have been marginalized so much in their life. They have been mistreated. They have been cheated so many times that it's so difficult for you uh, if you break your promise to them. So deliver what you, 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 you can and put reasonable expectation. Don't overpromise. Uh, and and just keep to your word, you know. Building relationship is everything. And in conservation, whether it's wildlife conservation, whether it's restoration, it's flora or ecosystem, building relationship takes years and a lot of patience. You know, I remember in WWF where we're doing the tiger-human conflict, you know, our friend Amle spent almost two years in one kampong, you know, just to build relationship just to build relationship so that he is accepted, you know, before even talking about conservation, you know. So, uh, anybody wants to do this in this whole webinar, you better commit to do it, you know. It's not a short-term, happy, happy project that you're going to live in two, three months' time. If you have that in mind, then uh, you probably uh, best to look for other programs, especially in tree restoration. Thank you. All right. So Someone yeah, suggests, you. Yep, yep, you need to have a webinar, another webinar, apparently. <laughs> All right. This is too much. It's quite heavy. But yeah. I mean, we're so heartened by your comments. I mean, really sweet comments from everyone. Uh, we really be encouraged by it. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start to wrap. <laughs> yes, wrap it up. So thank you, Shah. It sounds like, you know, that was like your final comments and, you know, your final pieces of advice. Um, so I just like to um, just let Martin and Yap as well um, say any final words um, to close this up. Maybe start with Yap. Uh, Martin? Would you or like Martin, <laughs> whichever. <laughs> Unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, guys, I mean, I salute you all. Great work. Uh, thanks for... Uh, bringing me in today. Um, uh, yeah, heartfelt condolences to you all. It's really uh, sad news about Balu. But uh, on this side of uh, Malaysia, we got your back and we're going to continue the work. So continue Balu's good work. Martin, please uh, give our compliments to your entire team and they're, they're amazing. We are so impressed and inspired by them. Kompel yeah. is impressive and inspirational, Martin. Keep it up. Um, yeah. You they fight every day, so that's why I'm still here. <laughs> Martin, Martin should, should share how long he has stayed with the community to do this. <laughs> that, that shows long-termness. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for, for listening uh, to me go on and on. Um, thank you to the host for the opportunity to, to share. Um, all I can say that I, is that you know, uh, we are all Malaysians. We have the responsibility to, to make Malaysia 
or uh, retain the title of a biodiverse uh, country. And, uh, and we have a lot of challenges ahead, but I think we can rise above the challenges. We will have all the necessary ingredients to make it work right. So thank you again for your support. Thank you again for listening. And thank you very much for all your caring thoughts and wishes uh, with regards to, to Balu. And uh, have a good day. Justine? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I've said enough. Thank you again. Um, it's been a great session and to our participants as well. Yeah, so thank you everyone for attending today. Sorry it took um, a little extra over time, but there's just not enough time to do justice to the work that everyone is doing, honestly. Um, so yeah, so please be in contact if you haven't um, joined the link for future webinars, future workshops, um, future technical training. Um, please do join my, uh, the mailing list for TRCRC and we will be updating you with more future programs. So thank you everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Right. Bye. Bye.